The Money Gym, Chapter 3, Cash Flow. The different kinds of cash flows. This is where we start getting into the nitty gritty. So if you haven't done all the exercises from modules one and two, you may want to go back now and do them. If you've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, then you'll know that there are three kinds of income flows. As an aside, it really does help if we use the water analogy with money, because it gives us a sense that money flows through, in and out of your life. It's not static. Although to employed people looking at a paycheck that never grows, it may well feel pretty static. There is earned income flow, passive income flow and portfolio income flow. We know about earned income. That's where we have to show up, do something, perform to a prearranged standard, stay somewhere until someone else says we can go home, where we have no control over the security of our jobs. But it's an essential income flow, especially in the early days of building our wealth. So it's best to try and earn as much as possible while working somewhere where we can gain some skills, experience or contacts that will help us in later life. The interesting thing is that most people don't imagine that they can have additional income flows if they have earned income. The thought of starting a business part time or doing some network marketing for a product they love or developing some intellectual property from something they know or are passionate about. This just does not cross their mind. I work too hard. I'm too tired, they say. Well, at the risk of becoming very unpopular here, rubbish. There is a lot of dead time in anyone's day. Time in the car, time on the train, commuting while tiring is great for this. Time in the evening, time at weekends. It's almost as if the action of earning a living lets them off the hook for taking responsibility for their own financial futures. Must be something to do with the employee mindset, perhaps. But the good news is that you can grow out of it. The other difference is that when you're developing something for yourself, your energy levels rise considerably. People always say to me, I don't know how you do it all. And yes, I know I do work harder than a lot of people, possibly too hard. But what people forget is that I enjoy what I do. Actually, I love it. So the line between work and fun and leisure blurs. Would I rather watch rubbish on TV or write my newsletter? Well, that's easy every time. Except for X Factor, Jamie Oliver, Gordon Ramsay, The Apprentice, any property programme and just about any forensic pathology thing going, obviously. These people always imagine that they have to spend all of their spare time doing the other activity. Not so. Just one hour a day will move you forward and in one year you may have a very respectable other income. Colin Turner's book Swimming with Piranhas Makes You Hungry is great for helping you clear out the clutter in your life to make room for other activities and it's very motivational too. Actually, that's a common belief among people who are just starting out on their financial journey that to do something well, you have to spend all your time doing it. It's the all or nothing mentality. I notice it in myself a lot. And it manifests itself in taking no action at all. But in my experience, any action or even just a little bit of action taken regularly makes a world of difference. If you just change 1% a day, that's a complete U-turn in less than half a year. But this is all still earned activity. The next income flow you may experience is portfolio income. That's where you receive income from your portfolio of investments. Investments in the stock market, investments in business or investments in property. You may already own some shares and receive dividends from those shares. They probably get paid right back to the company to increase your shareholding, but it's still dividend portfolio income. Some people have so many shares they can live on the income from the dividends. I would count rent from buy to let and a salary dividend from the family owned firm as portfolio income. Downline income from network marketing is portfolio income. In fact, anything where you have to invest a modicum of time, effort or knowledge is portfolio income. The final kind of income, the holy grail of financial intelligence, if you like, is passive income. Truly passive income can grow out of earned income and portfolio income. For example, where you have so many buy to let flats that you hire a property agent or manager to look after them for you. You just turn up once a quarter, every six months or once a year to review the figures. This book generates passive income. It grew out of earned income, the programme I use with my one to one clients. My old music industry website, Artist Manager, was largely passive income as it made me money without me having to do anything on a day to day basis. I used to think about it and email my software designer with ideas for improving it, but that's pretty much all once it was up and running. It earned up to £200 a week in its heyday. Other passive income sources include book royalties, 
licensing fees from artwork for a greetings cards, scarf or wallpaper manufacturer, etc. And if you write a top selling hit song, you're made for life. How many people know that Dolly Parton made more money from the song I Will Always Love You than Whitney Houston did? And Dolly didn't have to get out of bed once she'd written it. Now that's a nice thought, isn't it? Action step. What can you do and what do you know about that could be turned into earned income, then portfolio income, then passive income? Pick something you're interested in or passionate about, then it won't seem like work. We go into this in more detail in a later module, Profit From Your Passion, but you can get thinking about it now. Allocate half an hour a day, and yes, you do have time, just to think about it. And then when you have the idea, and you will, you will already have half an hour free to take some action on it. The financial integrity model. Most people put their wants before their needs and their needs before their integrity when it comes to their finances. I want a new car or I would love to be free comes first. Then I need to earn more money or for some people I need to be free. But they never think about their financial integrity. Freedom is not a want or a need but a luxury. A luxury that comes from financial integrity. A luxury which must be earned. Paraphrased from the Personal Foundation Finances Tape by Thomas Leonard. I was working with Jill Fielding, my then wealth mentor, when my personal coach, Rachel Turner, sent me the financial segment of Thomas's Personal Finan Foundation audio tapes. Audio tapes, well, that takes you back a bit, doesn't it? The above sentence really struck me and provided the missing piece of the jigsaw, so thank you, Thomas. This is a short, sharp shock day. Brace yourselves. Many people leave their day job without knowing how they're going to support themselves, and I have to say, new coaches are the worst for this. They hear all the talk about abundance and the universe providing and think that somehow, even with no marketing skills, no niche and no reservoir of potential clients, that people will be beating their door down to give them money. Perhaps they have a redundancy payment or some savings and think that the deadline for their money running out in three months will force them to take action and create a successful new business from scratch. Well, it ain't going to happen. How can you have cash flow if no cash is flowing? I regularly experience new clients coming to me for financial intelligence or internet marketing coaching. And the first thing we have to talk about is how they're going to pay their mortgage at the end of the month. Magic wand time again. The first thing I have to tell them is that I can help them work miracles on their business, but it will take a minimum of three to six months to build enough momentum, even if they work at it flat out, by which I mean five to ten hours a week where currently they only have time in their lives to come to a one-hour call. They say that they have to leave their job because they don't have time to apply themselves to their new business unless they do. Then they leave and their time gets filled up with pushing the washing on, having lunch with friends, doing all the self-care things that they've always wanted to do and spending time with the kids. Well, let me tell you now, building any new business can be a full-time job or at least it requires the equivalent of full-time dedication, even if out of office hours. Before leaving any job, you need to ensure that you can pay at least the basic bills for a good long time, six months to a year minimum, and also that you can afford to hire a mentor who has built a successful business in a short period of time using the methods you think you'll feel comfortable with. Otherwise, how are you going to know what to do and what works? So unless you're in financial integrity, you'll not be able to start any of the forthcoming steps to create financial freedom. Financial integrity is defined by me as having more money coming in than is going out. In the book, you'll find a picture of the Pyramid of Financial Power. I suggest you stop this audio and go and have a look at it. Because as Mr. McCorber says in David Copperfield, Dickens, annual income £20, annual expenditure £19, 19 shillings and sixpence, result happiness. Annual income £20, annual expenditure £20, ought and six, result misery. So the importance of the cash flow module to you is before you can go on to learn about the best ways to use your money to build financial freedom, you have to find ways to reduce your outgoings or to increase your income flows in order to create the spare cash that you can put to work for you, building your pyramid of financial power. Here's an action step for you. If you're working and thinking of leaving your job, download a copy of Mike Neal's Freedom Fund article from our website and put it into action. Mike's a great coach and he gave me permission to reproduce it for you. If you've already left work, find out how much money you have now and how many months it will last you. That's how long you have to make it work. If you have no money and don't know how to pay the bills at the end of the month, get a job, sell something or if at the very worst, get a loan to tide you over. 
It won't be forever, but you have to have money coming in no matter how little or to be able to pay your bills for three to six months to be able to build your business. You'll then be able to move forward. Here's a wealth building exercise. Monthly income and outgoings list. It's called a budget. For some people, this will be the first time they've sat down and really listed all their income and their outgoings. Most of the time, as long as they have enough money to cover their bills each month, they don't examine things any more closely. This attitude is more common than you may think. A very shrewd business owner friend of mine told me the other day that she doesn't have monthly management accounts, that her staff could be ripping her off and she wouldn't know. As long as the bank balance is roughly the same at the end of each month, she doesn't worry. And then she wonders why she doesn't make much of a profit. Becoming wealthy is not just about how much money you earn, it's about how much of that money you keep and then what you do with the money you keep. And the first step to working out how to keep more of it is knowing about cash flow. What cash flows in and what cash flows out. You'll find the budget sheets on page 52 of the Money Gym. The closer you can sit, stick to the categories shown, the easier it will be to use the simple cash flow forecast spreadsheet that you'll use when you've gathered all the information together. You can get a link to the spreadsheet when you join the money. Setting your rack rate. I had an amazing client called Sally. She was a high powered dynamic person who solves other people's problems, working particularly with fast growing companies whose turnover is growing faster than their ability to recruit staff. With a house in the country, a flat in Fulham and a very fancy car, you would think she had it made. But no, Sally is stressed. She's always firefighting financially and she struggles to pay her bills at the end of the month. She often ends up undercharging to get clients, overworking and then feeling deeply resentful. Another client is a holistic therapist who works wonders with Another client was a holistic therapist who works wonders with aromatherapy massage. If you have a bad back, have emotional blocks, are stuck in your life or you just want to treat yourself, Fiona was the person to see. Everyone sings her praises, but she's not yet making a truly great living from what she does. Why is that? Yet another client is Hermione, who works in the city for a big bank. She's an employee, and every month she stares in despair at her salary cheque. She's paid well, but she doesn't feel like enough. She's paid well, but it never feels like enough for what she has to do, and it certainly doesn't go as far as she wants it to, which is to buy a holiday home in France. The problem is the same for all of them. They haven't grasped that they'll never earn what they want unless they get very specific about what they want to earn. I want to thank my business coach pre my I want to thank my previous business coach Chris Barrow for this module. Chris at the time worked with two kinds of clients, firstly in the UK with dentists and worldwide with coaches via his million dollar coaching practice program. And it was in one of his workshops that I really got the message about how to set your fees or your hourly rate based not on what you earn now, but what you want to earn. Also thinking about how long in terms of days and hours you want to work. The magical thing about setting your rack rate, even if you're employed and earning much less than you want, is that it really focuses your mind on the fact that your standard of living is not going to improve unless you do something about it. Even more magically, it somehow makes you feel worth your new hourly rate, once you've worked it out, and it gets you focused on how much you want to be earning. If it turns out that your actual hourly rate is much less than your ideal rack rate, you can tell yourself that you're simply discounting temporarily. Many of my clients have gone on to improve themselves in order to qualify for promotions. Some have immediately applied for better paid jobs or created other income streams in order to come up to their ideal rack rate for more quickly. Most have stopped diddling about and got serious very fast. So how serious can you get about creating the income stream you deserve? Action step. You can download, you can download a tip sheet on how to set your rack rate at my website themoneygym.com. I would also recommend again the book Swimming with Piranhas Makes You Hungry by Colin Turner. It may be out of print now because if you can't it may be out of print now because I don't think you can buy it new at Amazon, but you will be able to get a new copy in bookshops or a second hand copy via Amazon. Your bath runneth over. The last thing anyone wants in real life is an overflowing bath. It can be one of the more expensive domestic disasters. But when thinking of all the wealth in the world as the sea of abundance, you can imagine that you're entitled to at least a bath full of abundance for yourself, and then you can get a great mental picture going. Your various income flows are the ways that you fill up the bath. Some incomes will be like filling it up with a teaspoon or a teacup. Some will be like filling it up with buckets. 
You could turn the taps and the shower on. You could run a hose pipe in. The more ways you fill your bath of abundance, the quicker you will get to the place where you hardly have to do anything and it spills over on a regular basis effortlessly. That's when you can have some fun, dancing and sloshing in the puddles you make, or spending the excess, excess income if you like. But beware, because your bath can have more than one plug hole. All the time you're working, both creatively and in the usual ways, to fill it up, there can be more and more plug holes mysteriously appearing. What are these plug holes? Well, they're standing orders and direct debits. I used to find it very easy to spend on something as long as I was paying monthly and not having to fork up in one lump sum. So I accumulated so many plug holes it was unbelievable. As fast as I tried to fill my bath, the faster the money ran away. And I had to earn more and more just to keep the water level steady, let alone make it rise to the magical brimming overflow level. There is something very disempowering about having lots of standing orders and direct debits coming out of your bank account every month, all on different days and never when you expect them to. It's even worse for self-employed people whose income may not come in exactly on the first of the month. Direct debits particularly seem to be one sure way to hand over control of your bank account to someone else. One of the turning points for me came when I started to look at all my direct debits and standing orders as extra plug holes in my bath of abundance. While considering a new purchase, I would think, yes, I could afford it on a monthly basis, but do I really want it, knowing it would just make even harder to fill my bath to overflowing? Could I pay it in one hit rather than monthly? Wealth warning. It is particularly easy to sign up online for that essential new bit of software or a service via your credit card. Then sometimes it can be quite hard to cancel that subscription. If you're involved in online businesses, one way to overcome that is to either use a pay-as-you-go card or have one card for each business and use it only for online purchases and direct debits on that business. Then if you want to start fresh and you can't work out how to cancel your subscription, you can just pay Then if you want to start fresh and you can't work out how to cancel your subscriptions, you can just cancel that card. You'll find a picture of the Bath of Abundance with all the plug holes on page You'll find a picture of the Bath of Abundance on page 56 in the book. And there's an action step on page 57. And there's an action step on page 57. How can you speed up the time when your bath of abundance overflows? First of all, get a printout of all your current standing orders and direct debits. Look at each one. Do you really need them all or are there out of date payments on there for things you no longer use? Cancel the ones you don't really need anymore. Look at your credit card statements and try and do the same. If you can't work out how to cancel any regular payments via the vendor's website, transfer the balance to a new lower interest card and cancel the old card. Before setting up any other payments, think to yourself, this is another plug hole in my bath of abundance. Do I really need it or could I pay for it in one hit? An ideal world. One of the first steps for setting some real measurable targets for wealth creation is to work out where you would like your income to come from. Don't get hung up on reality here. Let's just play for a while. First of all, let's look at your earned income. If you won the lottery, would you still work at anything? What would it be? Are you doing it now, perhaps? How would it change? How much of your total income do you want your earned income to be? 30%, 50%, or perhaps just 10%? When I had my hotel, it was earned income for a while at the beginning because I had to be there for it to work properly. Portfolio income is income that you don't have to turn up at an office every day to earn or don't have to be actually present all day every day to create, but it does require some input from you on a fairly regular basis. How much of total projected income flow would you like to be generated from this kind of income in the future when you're successful? 50%? 80%? 30%? With the hotel, as soon as I recruited a manager, trained and managed them with daily calls, weekly fo focus sessions and monthly management meetings, while I kept an eye on the business dashboard indicators, more about this in the Mind Your Own Business module, then it would take. Then it turned into part of my portfolio income. 
I was able to do more than one thing at a time and continue to build a portfolio of things, including my coaching, e-commerce income, artist manager, investing in property and shares and equities. What about passive income? This is income that you don't do anything to maintain beyond an hour or two every so often. What kind of passive income would you like? A fully automated internet business? Book royalties? An e-program income? Perhaps you would like to paint and have your paintings turned into greeting cards. Property income only counts as passive income if you intend to have a letting agent manage it for you. Equity investment only counts as passive income if you're buying shares that yield a dividend and require the minimum of in input from you. As soon as I recruited a manager to live in at the hotel and run the place for me, then it became largely passive income. I involved him in the I involved him in the business and gave him a profit related bonus so he was as keen for it to do well as I was and as careful about costs so it could have become very passive income over time. You can see how this can work very powerfully. Imagine one of your passive income segments was book royalties. Even if you have no idea yet of the kind of book you want to write you can see that if you put down your intention to earn £10,000 a year from book royalties you've moved one or two steps closer to realising that intention. Every journey is made up of a thousand steps and you just have to take the first one or two to get started. Beware of trying to be realistic when doing this exercise. Do it as if I had a magic wand. Whoops, there it is again. And can make it all come true for you. Realistic at this stage of the game kills dreams, squashes inspiration, makes life less of an adventure. Realistic is the worst enemy of those first few steps. Trust your subconscious. If you put down in black and white how you want your money to flow, but haven't got a clue how to go about it, then your subconscious will get beavering away on a solution. Here's an action step. Draw a large circle on a piece of paper and divide it into three segments, earned, passive and portfolio income. Now look at each one and divide it up into the kinds of earned, portfolio and passive income you'd like to cultivate. Only have a maximum of three mini segments for each major segment. Remember, this is not set in tablets of stone. You can always change or replace any segment later. Put the percentages in. Perhaps you've got 50% of your income being passive, and let's imagine you've chosen book, book royalties as one of your mini segments in the passive income segment. Now let's get even more specific. If you want to earn £100,000 per annum, with 50% being passive and 20% of that 50% coming from book royalties, that means you need to earn 10% per annum from some sort of book deal. This can either be advances on one new book per year of 10,000 or an advance every other year of 20,000 or no publishing advances at all but you could sell via the internet say 10 ebooks a week at 19 pounds 20 or 20 per week at 9 pounds 61. You could now create a mind map for each income flow and break down each one into different actions to take, investigations to make, people to talk to, websites to visit or books to read. Finish your chart and finally, pin it up somewhere you can see it every day. Let that old subconscious get to work for you. The money filter. One of the most powerful tools the wealthy have at their disposal is what I call a money filter. It enables them to legally filter more of their money into their pocket before the taxman takes his share. How does the money filter work? Imagine that you earn a thousand pounds a month or dollars. Usually, you would get taxed on that thousand after taking into account your personal tax allowance. Let's just say that you're taxed at 25%, so you end up at 750 after tax. Then you have to pay for your car and your mobile phone, together totalling 200 a month. That would leave you with 550 a month. Now, imagine you have your money filter in place. It changes things around completely. You earn your thousand, you pay for your mobile phone and car, 200 as before, then you get taxed on the 25% of the 800 left. Deduction of 200, you have filtered 50 into your pocket. Too good to be legal? Well, it gets better. Imagine that you have a day job and you've paid the 250 tax. If you have a money filter running alongside your day job, you can use it to pay for many of the things that you use every day, but don't get tax allowances for in your day job. For example, one of my money filters allows me to buy music magazines, buy tickets for and attend award ceremonies at the Hilton with accommodation, buy CDs and DVDs and travel all over the world to Miami and the south of France in particular. If my money filter spends slightly more than it earns, then I can even claim some of the 250 back out of the tax I paid for my day job. 
What is this money filter? It's simply a little business on the side of your day job, a sole tradership or a partnership perhaps. There is an even more sophisticated money filter available. It almost doubles the amount you're allowed to earn before you pay any tax. It's called a limited company. Each limited company has its own tax allowance, so the expenses, mobile phone, car, come off the earnings first, then the allowance is applied to the profits and then the ta taxman takes his cut. And an even more sophisticated version exists. That's where the entity that owns the limited company is another company, based in a country where there are no taxes payable at all. That company can be wholly owned by a person living in this country. These money filters effectively send the taxman from the front of the queue with his handout for your money to the back of the queue, after the mobile phone company and the car company, allowing you to enjoy the gadgets and gizmos out of pre-taxed income rather than post-taxed income. Action step. Are you starting to think that it might be worth turning the telly off one evening a week and starting a little second business? Is the motivation growing in you yet? Would you like to run your phone or your car, or perhaps a better version of either, out of the money that you usually pay the taxman. Important disclaimer. I must add here that you should always seek the advice of an accountant as to what is allowable against tax in any kind of business. My marketing jaunts to the Winter Music Conference in Miami Beach would not have been allowable if your second, second business was selling knitted loo roll covers, for example. I can't claim clothes against tax, but my sister, an opera singer, can claim her stage outfits. The taxman is not stupid after all, so don't think of him as being so. Eat me versus feed me. When you first get interested in wealth creation, one of the first questions is, so how do I find these opportunities? A bit later, you'll find you're overwhelmed with all the possibilities and opportunities that are jumping out at you from every corner. So how can you tell which ones to pursue? If you've read Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki, you will know about the does it eat me or does it feed me question, and it's a really useful first yardstick of how good a deal may be. Put simply, does it take money out of your pocket or does it put money into your pocket? If you have to invest some money to get to the opportunity, how much, for how long, and when will your return on that investment be by the end of the first year? If you have to invest some money to get into the opportunity, how much, for how long, and what will your return on that investment be by the end of the first year? This is known as your return on investment or ROI. If you can see that something will be putting money into your pocket within a year and there is another deal that won't, which one would you go for? If you can see that one deal will return you 10% within a year and one will return 30%, which deal is the more attractive? What about one deal where the return will be 30% but will take you longer than a year and be harder work? Against a deal that will return 20% but start returning that in six months is safer and doesn't require so much work. This is where many new investors and entrepreneurs come unstuck. They don't work out their strategy and stick to it, so they alternate between fear and greed, much like the stock market has been recently, and they go for the riskier, harder deal for a bigger return, instead of the safer, easier deal with a slightly lower return. Think about how many of the second kind of deal could you do, with less effort, less stress, and the faster returns. The other thing they look for is to try to bend a deal to work for them, rather than just going to look for another deal that does effortlessly. Jill Fielding always used to say that she would rather have done the easier deal, leaving her time to get her nails done, rather than one big difficult deal where she'd really have to work for her money. And as someone who's tried to bend deals to fit on many occasions, I now have to agree 100%. Action step. The first thing to do is to create a yardstick for any deal you're considering. The return on investment figure can be applied to anything and you can compare like for like even if the deals are very different. How much profit will a deal make in the first year, multiplied by 100, divided by the amount of money you're going to have to invest to acquire that profit? That, roughly speaking, is your return on investment expressed as a percentage. A house that costs 50000 and will generate 2400 per annum of rental income profit after expenses roughly generates a 4.8% return on investment. This is not to be confused with the figure known as rental yield, which is different again. If you think that the property may grow in value by 10% that year, then add 5000 to the 2400 rental profit and you, you now find that your return on investment is now 14.8%. 
Compare that with a similar deal where you can buy a business card printing machine franchise, for example, generating £25,000 a year profit, and you have to put in 75000 to acquire the business. It's a 33.3% return on investment, and you have to go around emptying the money. Is it worth it for those returns, you might say? But what if you had an 80% mortgage on the property and the interest repayments were covered by the rent, still leaving you the same rental profit per annum? You've spent 10k to acquire that profit, you have a profit including capital appreciation of 7,400, so your return on investment is now 74% per annum, with no money collection. But whichever way, both returns are a bit better than the Building Society returns and both are feed me opportunities. Use your yardstick, don't change the goalposts and chase Use your yardstick, don't change the goalposts and choose opportunities that fit your strategy or plan, whatever that may be. Catastrophe and contingency funds. Okay, so now we accept that we deserve to pay ourselves first, so what do we do with the money? Your catastrophe fund. Out of our 80% salary, first we must create a flow of about 10% to pay ourselves first. And the first thing we're going to do with this money is to create a catastrophe fund in a different bank or savings account to our freedom fund, as outlined in Mike Neal's article, which you can get from our website. This is not money for unexpected, irregular and intermittent expenses. You know, the, one that we've, you know, the ones we forget to budget for and end up scrabbling to find the cash for, like a new lawnmower, auto repairs or ballet classes. No, this is for major catastrophes such as divorce, losing your job or fe falling ill when perhaps your only other fallback would have been to turn to the personal loans or credit cards. Experts usually agree that this should be between three to six months living expenses, or you may prefer to set a particular amount of money down here. What would make you feel secure? 2,000, 5,000, 10,000, or even 20,000? This will become your second line of defence against incurring debt. See below for the first line. This will become your second line of defence against incurring debt, and we're going to cover your first line in a moment. Use a different account with a 30-day withdrawal notice period and set up a standing order from your day-to-day -day account into this account. Remember, this is a limited time period payment. When your set figure is reached, you can divert this money elsewhere. Tip. You could either start this with your entire 10% or do half and half, perhaps, with half going towards your contingency fund, which I'm going to cover now. Your contingency fund. Figure about a thousand for your contingency fund. This is an amount of liquid cash, money you can get your hands on 24 hours. Money you can get your hands on in 24 hours for the minor emergencies in life. We're talking about boilers blowing up, camshafts breaking, who knows what they are but I know they're expensive, or perhaps the roof leaking and needed to be fixed fast before the insurance company will pay up. Remember, this is a finite amount. When the fund is full, you will divert the monthly amount put into it into something else. Your attitude towards this fund will either make or break your new financially intelligent lifestyle. This is not a pool of money to be used for anything you fancy, like a holiday or a new coat, but a cushion amount that will be used, then topped back up from the odds and sods fund. Action step. How are you going to set this up? I'll talk more about bank accounts on day 30. I'll, put, I'll talk more about bank accounts later, but you should know that there are different bank accounts on the market that allow you to have as many accounts as you like, called whatever you like. Why not investigate a few banks both on and offline to see if they have this facility? Your odds and sods fund. OK, brace yourself, this is a tricky one to get your head round straight away. Before credit, people had to plan ahead. Whether you had a lot or only a little, you never spent all of it because anticipation meant survival. Then the easy availability of, then the easy availability of credit meant running out of cash didn't mean running out of money, leading us to think that being able to spend money was the same as having money. Anticipation meant thinking only of the good things that were anticipation suddenly only meant thinking of the good things that were going to happen, like marrying someone rich, winning the lottery, or more basically a pay rise, the monthly wage check, the next holiday. 
It didn't mean the unexpected trip to the dentist, the new shoes, the car breaking down. So we stopped anticipating, we stopped planning, we got sloppy. We started to consider occasional expenses as optional expenses and it's only when one rises up screeching and bites our bottom does it become an essential expense. We are, use, we are using up and wearing out our cars, our clothes, our homes a little bit every day. How much are you thinking about the brakes on your car that are going to break for the very last time in about eight weeks from now? When the unexpected expenses come at us seemingly out of nowhere, we collapse in financial shock and have to reach for the credit cards. But really, they're not that unexpected expenses, are they? We just didn't do anything about them or planning for them. But it is crucial to plan for these things as well, and this is where the Odds and Sods Fund comes in. Action Step Step-by-step -step instructions Step 1. Determine your irregular, unexpected and intermittent expenses. List them and then estimate what you spent on each in the last 12 months. Divide each by 12 to get a monthly amount and total up that monthly amount. Divide each by 12 to get a monthly amount and then total up all those different monthly amounts. Step 2. Open up a bank account called Odds and Sods account or any other name you like. Set up a standing order for the total monthly amount as worked out in Step 1. Step 3. Set up a mini day book for each category in your Odds and Sods account and when the first standing order goes through, enter the credit amount as your opening balance on each sheet. Step 4. If you have to write a cheque for or get some money out for any category, enter it as a debit in that category. You will find in the beginning that sometimes you will have to write a cheque that is bigger than the credit balance for that category, but it will usually be covered by the amounts deposited for the other categories and will go back into credit as you deposit the next month's standing order. Step 5. When you get used to using this method, enter any unexpected windfalls to this account, but also add them to a new category, a dream account. Add in dream categories like a new computer or perhaps a holiday. Step 6. Your goal is to have a full year's requirement for any category in each sub-account at any one time. The best thing about the Odds and Sods account is that when you reach the amount you estimate you spend in a year on any category, you can divert the extra one. You can divert the extra to one of your dream categories. Wealth warning. Beware of thinking of your Odds and Sods account as a savings account. It is not. The money in there is meant to be spent on the planned things and it is meant to ebb and flow. Financially intelligent bank accounts. One of the things I've struggled with for years is the question of having different bank accounts for different activities, which makes sense. Yet trying to keep things simple because as sure as eggs is eggs, any money is invariably in the wrong account at the wrong time. I know that any other living on the edge entrepreneurs will know what I'm talking about. I needed a blueprint on how to design a supportive environment using my bank accounts, one that would be almost automatic, one that would work. The first glimmer came when I read Mike Neal's Freedom Fund tip that you can get from our website at themoneygym.com. I think it's perfect for employed people who want to leave their business. I think it's perfect for employed people who want to leave their job and start a business. To read it in full if you haven't yet, come along to the website and sign up for your free 30-day trial of Silver Level at the Money Gym. It covers setting up your bank account as if you were already self-employed, and it's brilliant. Then, just after this, I was reading Mary Hunt's book, Debt Proof Living, which is excellent, by the way, and she goes into bank accounts in great detail. A light bulb moment for me. Wow, I realised that if you combined the stuff in Mike Meal's Freedom Fund tip, it would be a great blueprint for how to set up your bank accounts to be a support system, a new environment to help you evolve into your new financial lifestyle. And you can do that while earning interest on your savings at the same rate as you're paying on your mortgage if you use one of those combined mortgage bank accounts. Better than any savings rates around. There are even new bank account products now where you can have several different pots or jars called whatever you like with another account or pot for the mortgage. Some even let you have a credit card account to use alongside the others. At the stroke of midnight they take all your balances, credit or debit, and put them up against each other and you only pay interest on your mortgage credit card negative balance less whatever credit balances are in your pots. How cool is that? Action step. Okay, so you have all the information. You need to find a bank where you can have different pots with different names 
but every day they tot up your credit and debit balances and your mortgage credit cards and you only pay interest on the combined debit balance. If you're struggling with this concept, find a mentor, a coach or an independent financial advisor who can explain it to you better than me. It's just too crucial and expensive to ignore it.